Queen of Sheba in the Hebrew Bible and the three wise men of the New Testament are traditionally linked to Yemen. Coffee originated in Ethiopia, but Yemen for centuries was a primary producer. Now you're lucky to get a cup of Nescafe instant. Located at the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula with the Red Sea on the west and Arabian Sea on the south, Yemen has long been a strategic part of the world. The country is about three quarters as large as Texas with an official population of 30 million, but given the Civil War, I think that's a wild guess. Through the centuries, Yemen has been under foreign rule and influence many times. The southern area was part of the Persian Empire into the 600s AD. The Ottomans arrived in 1500, but were expelled about 100 years later. They returned in 1849 to the north, but faced a revolt, and then their empire collapsed in 1918. To mix it up even more, eastern Yemen was under control of the Omani Empire for about 100 years from the 1750s. And that empire went into western, or excuse me, eastern Africa. The British had a strong presence in South Yemen, taking over Aden and its port in 1839, and didn't leave until 1967. They established protectorates for more than a dozen statelets to keep out the Ottomans, whose power waxed and waned in the north until it collapse of that empire. After the British pulled out in 1967, Yemen had three distinct political divisions. The three divisions became two, but it wasn't long before the Marxists gained power and the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen became a socialist state. It controlled everything along the Arabian Sea and the Gulf of Aden, including the historic port of Aden. A United Republic of Yemen was created in 1990, but that was a name only. There were a lot of communities and many divergent interests. The biggest problem with Yemen for centuries was lack of a dominant tribe to unify the country, which became the norm in almost all the other Arab states. The first civil war over separatism broke out in 1994 and only lasted two months. Since 2007, a movement has been active for former South Yemen to secede from the Republic. Going back in time, when the North became independent of the Ottomans in 1918, a power struggle led by a local imam set the course for the current civil war that's devastated Yemen since, since 2014. Most of the fighting has been in the north, which happens to be the country's most productive agricultural area. Except for the coastal strip of the blue area, the majority is desert with some oil fields in the upper part. The dividing line between the two Yemens pretty much follows what the British established over 150 years ago. Because of the war, the capital of Sana'a was abandoned in 2015 and relocated temporarily to Aden. Temporary meaning seven years and counting. With images like this of Sana'a, it's easy to see why people have fled, including the agent who set up my trip, as I mentioned earlier. He was forced to relocate to Sayun. So now we have President Hadi, who's no longer president. When I first built this PowerPoint, um, it needed some updates for this program, and the first one hit on the 7th of this month. He stepped down as president, turning it over to a council. And of course, we have the Saudis. Emirates was wise enough to get the hell out. But then we've got Iran in the background. Hate to see it, but the USA also. 
And if you can call them beneficiaries, we've got Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Iran, a background player in all too many regional countries. And if there's any other good news in this war, it's that the two sides have accepted a two-month truce beginning with the holy month of Ramadan, which started one April. And as far as I know, that truce is still in effect. Of course, the human toll, incalculable. Yemen's people are hardly the only ones suffering from war. To the west, there's Ethiopia, Syria further north, and of course, most recently, Ukraine. I entered Yemen by land on Saturday, 5 October 2019. The agent in Yemen had arranged for transportation from Sal Salala, Oman, excuse me, to the border uh, with a stop in Al Qaeda, um, Al Qaeda, for the night. Road distance was about 233 kilometers, 145 miles, which took over six hours of travel. I discovered belatedly that Yemen is in a different time zone than Oman. So that was my stopping point for the night. As to what was safe for tourist travel in late 2019, the mainland was pretty much limited to the southeastern coast and the Hadramat area, including Seyoun, which had the only operating international airport. Ironically, the so-called safe area also had Al-Qaeda presence. To illustrate a bit of contrast between the ten countries, this is what I left behind in Oman. Here was a boulevard in Salala, Oman, the last city I visited in that country. You won't find anything like it in Yemen. The slow trip wasn't because of dawdling on the part of the Omani driver. At one point, he hit 165 kilometers an hour, which is 103 miles an hour, steering the Toyota Camry with his knees sometimes, fiddling with his phone, and using both lanes to drive in. The only similarities between the two countries was a coastline of the Arabian Sea. Gotta say, that road trip to the border scared the hell out of me. The highway west from Salala required a tedious climb through the hills, which forced my kamikaze driver to slow down. This is an impressive piece of engineering on the part of the Omanis. Each of those terraces you see on the left is another switchback on the highway. After a cool down at the top, we were off on narrower road. The section swung inland, and I remember being in low clouds and fog. The Omani border crossing was at Sarfat, with Yemen about 20 more miles away. I took no pictures at the actual crossing, and there are none posted online. My passport and paperwork were taken to a window by the driver, and it took well over an hour to exit Oman and get processed into Yemen. Supposedly, the only way a Westerner can enter Yemen is through a work visa. And anybody, uh, can, if, they, if you can read Arabic and tell me if that's a work visa, I welcome you to do it. Once I was legal, I transferred to a different Omani vehicle coming from the Yemen side. This isn't my picture, but I can vouch for the gate being opened by an armed soldier to enter Yemen. The majority of the vehicles I saw in Yemen didn't have license plates, but this is the most recent version of a private vehicle plate. Notice it's attached by pop rivets to make it harder to remove. Arabic is the official language, and the country is overwhelmingly Muslim. The minute through that big gate, I knew I was in a foreign country. The road leading into Hof, the first village in eastern Yemen, was narrow and in poor condition. 
The landscape was green thanks to fog and mist. Further west, that wasn't the case. With scattered hulks of abandoned vehicles, it reminded me of Somalia. Rubbish was everywhere, and that was the case for all of Yemen. The road followed the Arabian Sea. The surface was broken in many spots and nothing at all like traveling in Oman. It made for a slow ride. At least the scenery helped offset the poor road conditions. Eventually, we made it to El Gaida, where the Omani driver hooked me up with my Yemeni driver and guide. Best information I can find seems to indicate a population of around 20,000. It's noted for its airport, but in December 2017, Saudi Arabian troops took control of it, part of that country's involvement to prop up the failing Yemeni government. After months of protest, it was returned to Yemen control in July 2018. This part of Yemen has been spared much of the devastation of Yemen's civil war. However, on 2 October 2020, a year after I was here, Yemeni security forces killed three suspected Al-Qaeda militants during a raid in the city. Here was my hotel with my room on the upper floor. The lobby was filled with flies, English was almost non-existent, and the elevator didn't work, probably never had. I had to ask for a towel and bottled water, and toilet paper wasn't furnished because they said guests steal it. No problem, I don't live, leave home without it. After getting help from one of the staff, I did connect to Wi-Fi. From my first day in Yemen, I wore a distasha I'd bought in Oman to not be quite so conspicuous. The driver tied my turban each morning. Jamil, my guide, wore a man's skirt called a futa. He claimed he didn't know how to tie a turban and wore no head covering. My two guys took me to the beach for our first stop. At one point, Saudi Arabia prevented fishermen from leaving the shore, accusing them of smuggling arms to the Houthi rebels. The Cornish, normally a city's high point, was a dismal destination in Al Qaeda. All the lights were broken and inoperable, and of course, rubbish was everywhere. It was another indicator of almost complete breakdown of government in Yemen. We went to this souk that dealt almost exclusively in drugs, specifically cat. And there's various spellings for it. You can look it up on the internet. I'm using QAT and uh, probably some differences in spelling too. Or uh, yeah. The leaves are the source of a habituating stimulant. Installated cardboard boxes were packed with ice to keep the product cool from farms in the west and then transferred to insulated chests. The rubbish eventually finds its way to the sea. Some growers wrap their cat in aluminum foil, so depending on what part of Yemen you're in, it's foil or plastic waste or both. Buyers are very picky about quality, and wilted cat is not acceptable. It's almost impossible to get a cup of coffee in Yemen, which was the first country to cultivate it, because coffee plantations have been converted to growing drugs, which are more profitable. For, the, your, for you botanists, if you're interested in the scientific name, it's Cata edulis. None of the mainland hotels in Yemen serve food. The first morning, we went looking for breakfast. At this outside table, the man casually laid down his Russian-made assault rifle. Weapons are permitted in restaurants, but not hotels. They have to be checked at reception. The guide told me we carried two weapons with us, and prior to leaving town, the driver went to a butcher shop for two clips of ammunition that he dropped into the door pocket. 
Then we were on the road again in our minivan with no air conditioning. The coastal mountains were always on my right as we drove south and west. From our stop at Al Qaeda, we made a brief stop at the port city of Nishtun. At first glance, this doesn't look like a big deal. The port is a major receiving point for petroleum products and other goods, as well as supporting a fishing fleet. However, the Saudi military took control in 2017, and all cargo has to be processed through them. It's part of Saudi Arabia's reason for being in Yemen, that being construction of an oil pipeline from the, from the kingdom to the Arabian Sea. The town suffers from lack of potable water and has no critical medical facilities. Patients have to be taken to Al Qaeda North or Mukulla West or even all the way to Salala in Oman. This is one of several signs I saw in Yemen erected by Saudi Arabia. My guide said there was no reconstruction, it was all propaganda by Saudi Arabia. And he was very vociferous about it. He had no use for the Saudis. The highway moved away from the coast, rolling through gravelly desert at this point. The route also climbed some significant hills. This village we whipped by had a new mosque under construction with demolition rubble dumped anywhere. The landscape kept changing with some unique formations here. Someone had painted something in Arabic on the rocks down below. Once again, the Arabian Sea came into view. Here was the equivalent of a local rural taxi filled with Muslim women. Notice there's no license plate. Nobody cares. The large freight trucks in front were from United Arab Emirates since Yemen doesn't have anything that big. We experienced a lot of this along the drive. At almost, at almost every wadi, the intermittent desert, desert stream courses, the pavement had been destroyed by Cyclone Makuno in May 2018. The storm hit one and a half years earlier, and there were no efforts to repair anything, unlike Oman, that fixed its highway almost immediately. The highway was too unsafe to travel at night because of collapsed bridges and unmarked hazards. Here was another desert village with scattered rubbish to find its way to the ocean. And more damaged road. For a major corridor, it's probably the worst I've experienced anywhere in the world. Many of the broken sections served as places for displaced Muslim women with children to set up rough shelters and beg from passing motorists. Because of the road conditions, everybody was forced to stop or st at least slow to a crawl, so they picked them as opportunist points for getting a few uh, coins. We stopped for lunch at a roadside dive, which reinforced the horrible quality of food in Yemen. We also encountered many checkpoints, most of them staffed by ragged men without uniforms, but carrying weapons. They were probably Al-Qaeda. If you're trying to identify those blue flowers, let me just say they originated from oil. It was a stop at another drug market. The driver was a cat addict, and he needed to resupply. By late afternoon, we made it into the city of El Mukula, approximately 483 kilometers, 300 miles from El Gaida. The drive, with stops, took eight and a half hours. This is the fifth largest city in Yemen with around 300,000 population. There are no tra working traffic lights. For about a year between 2015 and 2016, 
Al-Qaeda took control until it was recaptured by forces from United Arab Emirates. Al-Qaeda closed the airport in April 2015, and it didn't reopen until late November 2019, after I had left Yemen. The Yemen Grand Hotel was my lodge for the night and the best I had in all of Yemen with good Wi-Fi. The electricity went out at least three times and the hotel's generator kicked in each time. It was also cool enough to turn off the AC and just run the ceiling fan. And as I'd said earlier, the hotels don't serve food, so no dinner for me. Al Mukalla was founded in 1035 as a fishing settlement. It's still an important seaport for this part of Yemen. On 3 November 2015, a cyclone Chapala struck the city and severely damaged the waterfront. During British times, it was regarded as the Venice of the East. The city is the center of Yemen's fishing industry and has several fish processing plants. Breakfast for me on the morning of 6 October consisted of a plate of canned baked beans mixed with canned tuna from Indonesia. It's cheaper than the local variety. Even though this is the capital city of Yemen's largest government, Hadramat, I'd be hard pressed to call it attractive. Remember, the Brits call this the Venice of the East. We took a short walking tour of the old part of the city. This prop block probably predates World War II and was once a beautiful part of the city. The detail in the old buildings is exquisite, but everything was dirty and has fallen into disrepair. Entry doors like this and the surrounding trim were works of art. Notice how worn the sill is under the right door. Three power meters and two water meters serve this house. Even the metal grates over the windows were artistic. This was a common sight in mainland Yemen, when an extended family from one house wants to connect with the other side of the alley, they punch holes in the walls and install a covered corridor. In short, an overpass. There were two dynasties in Hadramat, and the rulers both built palaces. Mayin Palace in El Bukala was built by Sultan Omar in the 1920s. The two three-story buildings have been turned into a museum, but both were under renovation and closed to the public. The Sultan served with the British military in India, which explains Indian influence in the architecture. The city's fish market was a messy place with no refrigeration or ice. Women can shop here, but they don't run any stalls. With no way to cool the fish, I'm sure it gets smellier as the day progresses. Dried fish was sold outside under colored canopies, which is why this man and his fish look so red. My guide told me that dried is more popular than fresh because it doesn't spoil. The odor was far more intense than from the fresh fish inside, another reason for these vendors to be in the open. This stall had a phone number in case you wanted to call. Another market dealt with fruits and vegetables. Western Yemen has always been an agricultural stronghold with plentiful water. It's hard to tell how much it was local and what may be imported. The apples certainly wouldn't have come from Yemen. The outside stalls were run by women, whom my guide said were probably Somalian refugees. None wanted to be photographed. 
After seeing this, I realized that vegetables were available, it's just that they didn't seem to make it to the restaurants and potential customers like me. On the northeastern edge of El Mucala is El Guizi Fort, perched on an outcropping. It was built in 1716 to protect the city from Bedouin attacks. It looked quite different in the 1960s before restoration. This is considered an architectural masterpiece. The base is built of stones and the upper part of mud bricks. The fortress is fenced to keep out wandering goats, but the gate wasn't locked, so we let ourselves in. We didn't climb the stairs since the fort was probably locked. It was still used late into the 19th century. That was the last of El Mucala. We had to backtrack and make our way northwest onto the plateau and into some spectacular canyons. We stopped at the village to watch this high-tech operation involving blindfolded camels walking around in a circle. The crude roof gave them a shelter from the sun. The camels operated a rudimentary mortal and pestle which ground sesame seeds into oil. There were several of these operations in the village and it's the only place in Yemen where this is done. It takes about one and a half hours to grind a batch. Because the camels are blindfolded, they think they're actually going somewhere. And unfortunately, I didn't switch into movie mode for this. The landscape changed again as we kept climbing. The road here was two lane and the big trucks were forced to, crawl, forced to a crawl because of a steep grade. Once we topped out, the gravelly desert reminded me of Nevada or Utah. Elevation was almost 5,000 feet. It looks barren, but nomads live here and graze animals. It gets quite cold in winter, and they've built clusters of brick houses to move to when tent living isn't so practical. Power lines were overhead, but the government does nothing to help these folks. If they want electricity, they have to bootleg it off the system. With hand dug wells for water, they're able to survive. But the children don't go to school. We turned off the main road past these two fake guard houses through a gate to Hyad Al Jazeel Resort. It's inside a walled compound, which means rubbish from outside doesn't get blown in. Complete with swimming pool, this lodge was built by a Saudi businessman in 2007. Because it's so remote, the staff is lodged in a separate building on site. The rooms are designed in traditional Yemeni style with woven curtains over the shutters that are opened from the inside. My room was large but spartan. I wrote in my journal that the bed was hard and lumpy. I had air conditioning and a fan, but electricity was only available from 5 p.m. until 6 a.m. This resort had no generator. We were the only guests that night, and they fixed me vegetable stew with bread for dinner. So let's go through the curtains outside to the patio for a view of Wadi Dawan. This map shows how extensive this wadi system is. I liken it to a series of fingers that extends for 400 miles, draining south to the Arabian Sea. We had come in from El Mukala, and we were now at the southern end of the area. All of Yemen's water courses are seasonal. The country has no year-round rivers. 
Looking down provided a view of the mud brick village of Hayad al Jazil, a collection of 45 houses, 500 years old. As of October 2018, there were only 17 residents. Many of the houses had fallen into neglect thanks to termite damage to wooden support beams and rain damage to the bricks. And again, children living here, they don't go to school. The half moon was visible at sunset and I could hear voices of nomads in their white tents on the rim. This was the best of Yemen for me. Sunset was brief but colorful. I made sure I was up before sunrise to watch the light drop into the wadi. It's a beautiful mosaic of patterns, textures, and colors. The soil supports wheat, millet, and barley, fruits, dates, alfalfa, and tobacco, and of course the drug cat. The wadi flows seasonally to provide irrigation water. We, we, we left the resort at 8 a.m. on 8 October and drove north, continuing into Wadi Davan. A confluence of two wadis provides flat ground for agriculture. Houses are built on the hillsides. We dropped down to the road going upstream. A wealthy Saudi whose family came from this area paid for paving the road. These fingers all lead to dead ends with one central corridor connecting them. The geology looks very similar to our American Southwest. Most of these areas have been ruled by Al-Qaeda some years earlier. The largest structure in this village was a multi-storied mud brick palace owned by the rich Saudi I had just mentioned. It was built in 1955 and sat largely unused for 40 years. Renovations were done at some point and the lower floor is supposedly a hotel, but there were no guests. A lone watchman with his Chinese rifle guarded the premises. And here you see the terrorist problem in Yemen. I gotta say, that rifle was bloody heavy. This is one of the main entrance doors with its ornate details. The palace is locked up except for when the family visits. Painted in pastel colors, other houses also belong to the complex. The mosque was also part of the village. Most of the surrounding buildings are over 150 years old and many have been renovated. Electricity is available for only, a few, only for a few hours a day. Potable water comes from springs in the hills and is carefully metered. It's remarkable that these tall buildings are built entirely of mud bricks. With thick walls, they stay relatively cool in summer and retain heat in winter. This house hadn't been renovated yet, unlike the one in back. The Yemeni trademark is ornate windows and shutters, along with intrinsically designed doors. Ancient vehicles like this Isuzu truck are part of what keeps Yemen mobile. Women seemed to do all the animal tending and most of the field work. They didn't want to be photographed, so the only way was with, was with telephoto lens. The most unusual characteristic of Muslim women's garb in this part of Yemen are the conical straw hats to shield them from the brutal sun. They are called madhalas, 
Not only were their bodies and faces covered in black, so were their hands. Because of such an unusual sight, looking like witches, foreigners want to take pictures. It's extremely hard to do, and there's no point in asking permission, even by the guide, so I had to do it on the sly. And as I mentioned, this is the only part of Yemen where these hats are worn. We left that wadi and drove into a different one. None of the houses had air conditioners because they consumed too much electricity, but many have swamp coolers since they just use a rotating fan. It was lush greenery inside the canopy, including palm trees. Irrigation was by rainwater when it comes, or pumped from groundwater. Bricks are still made by hand for new construction or repairs to existing buildings. Using mud and straw, it's a simple recipe. They are much larger than our bricks here at home. The Wadis are known for their honey production, supposedly the best in the world. Their hives were nothing else were like nothing else I've seen. Some of them were repurposed plastic drums, like on top, or like on top, a different container with a narrow opening. We stopped to watch this bee caper swapping out full combs of honey for empty ones. He was suited up but didn't use any smoke. The air was full of angry bees, and even though I was a good distance away, I got stung on my forehead. It was my only encounter with a Yemeni terrorist. This was the only flower I got close enough to for a picture, and rather than a bee, it had an ant in it. We left the bees and threaded our way down the narrow village street in the wadi. Off to the side was the town of El Rubat, birthplace of, Os of, birthplace of Osama bin Laden's father. My guide insisted that Osama was born here, but online information refutes that. He also said that one of Osama's wives came from here, which was also wrong information. My drug addict driver wanted his picture taken with the alleged home of Osama bin Laden in the background. In 1930, Osama's father founded a construction company in Saudi Arabia and became the wealthiest non-royal Saudi at one time. He fathered 56 children from 22 wives but he never had more than four wives at a time. Moving out of that wadi, we passed a number of cinder block houses under construction in a different area. Most weren't as attractive as the old classics and they didn't have the insulating value of the adobe houses. Especially for commercial buildings, cinder block construction seemed to be the way to go. We pulled into this settlement that was completely different from anywhere else in Yemen in that it was spotlessly clean. It seemed consistent that most bread brick villages were a mix of old and new. Here was a new cement brick building abutting an adobe house. Jamil led us through the maze of streets. Water was piped from hillside springs, and every house had a meter. Many of the doors and shutters had bright, fresh paint. At a couple of houses, the woven blinds were pushed aside by curious children. Once they realized a Westerner with a camera was out there, the blinds were quickly closed. The mosque looked new and wasn't built of mud bricks. 
school had let out for lunch and gave me an opportunity to photograph some kids. They had stopped to buy junk food. That's a common scene around the world. When the school lets out at noon, they head to the junk food counters. Jamil struck up a conversation with this pair and found out they weren't related. Notice there's a can for trash by the girl, a rarity in Yemen. She let herself in through the massive door, showing the low ceiling of the house, at least on the ground floor. We left that exceptional village and got back on the road through more villages, eventually catching the highway to Seyun. When I was in Yemen, Seyun and Aden had the only functioning international airports on the mainland. From the highway, we saw another mud brick village called El Hajarain that goes back a thousand years. The name means two villages because the two towns are located on opposite sides of the wadi. We didn't go in, but online reports say it's crumbling badly. Not far west of Seyun is Shibam, referred to as, quote, Manhattan of the desert. It's one of the oldest and best examples of urban planning based on the principle of vertical construction. The site was first settled 2,500 years ago, but most of the buildings date from the 16th century. All of the 470 houses are built of mud bricks, the tallest being 98 feet high. This area was hit by a cyclone in 2008 that did a lot of damage. The Civil War has, called occupants, has caused occupants to flee and without money and maintenance, the city is in danger of crumbling. The passageways are too narrow for cars, but they serve as wind tunnels where in summer, temperatures can reach 54 degrees Celsius, which is about 129 Fahrenheit. The only charm of Seyun, if you can call it that, were the topiaries. Otherwise, it's another dusty, unattractive part of Yemen. It dates to the mid-fourth century and was named after a woman who ran a cafe for weary travelers. The population is around 70,000 and more importantly, had an operational international airport. This was my home hotel for the night, the last on the mainland. I met my Yemeni agent here who had set up my trip and paid him the balance of the money I owed. The down payment had been wired via MoneyGram through the local Walmart. Talk about a convoluted way to do business. The staff didn't speak English and had their cheeks distended with wads of cat. It was fine for one night, and I doubt there were many choices to accommodate Westerners in Seyun. Jamil took me for a walking tour that covered a few blocks, but provided a great deal of diversity. It was crowded with blowing dust, and one had to be careful not to get run over by motorbikes or cars. I'd already seen water pipes and meteors above ground in the Wadi villages, but this vertical manifold was unique in an urban setting. Shops were geared totally to the people living nearby and not tourists, since there were virtually none. The shopkeeper even offered a bucket of dried fish. This shop dealt strictly in honey. If you brought your own container, it would be filled and weighed on the scales in the lower right. Away from the Mizzy Bain business area were the multi-storied houses and firewood cellars. Many were newer, made of concrete or brick. This little girl had wandered away from her house, but Jamil knew where she belonged since this was his neighborhood. 
he invited me into his home. Jamil and his mother lived here, along with three brothers and a sister and her four children. This kitchen area on the ground floor had the sink, but the gas range and refrigerator were on the next level up. There were so many stairs and blind corners that I felt I needed a map. I saw a flash of Jamil's mother's face when she popped around a corner but that was all the contact she wanted with a Westerner in her house. The bathroom also served as laundry room for the washer only. Drying was done outside on the balcony. To flush the squat toilet, you need to fill the bucket from the taps on the wall and pour it in. For a shower, you fill the basin or bucket and pour water over yourself. The bedrooms I saw were cramped and crowded. This was a room on the upper floor, not a bedroom, with well-worn linoleum at the passageway with a curtain. The brightest place in the house was this common area on the top floor that opened to the outdoors with a small patio. The layout of the house and the extended family living arrangement wouldn't work at all in our society. The green domed mosque on the left wasn't as interesting to me as the mud brick house. The palm tree A-frame had been used to hoist water from the communal well back in the day. The well was now closed off and no longer used. The newer El Jama mosque was lit by the setting sun and surrounded by flying birds. Probably the most prominent landmark in Seyun is the Sultan's Palace, originally built as a defensive fort in the 19th century. It was converted into a residential palace of 90 rooms by Sultan al Qateri in the 1920s. To make sure the main architect didn't build another one like it, the Sultan had him beheaded. In 1948, the neighborhood looked a lot different. The mud brick and stone complex consists of 16 buildings and has been converted to a museum. Socotra has been described as, quote, the most alien looking place on earth, unquote, and was a continuation of my trip to Yemen. My agent on the mainland had arranged for a driver and guide on the island. Geographically, the island was once a part of Africa and is much closer to Somalia land than Yemen. It took about an hour to fly from Seyun on the mainland. Even with its isolation, human habitation has been traced to 3,000 years ago. But there's trouble on Socotra. The island is ostensibly owned by Yemen, but Emirates has had their fingers in, in this part of the world, too. So 2016 is the first uh, evidence that they uh, set up military camp. Then in 18, they moved in more equipment. The Saudis were there, but uh, from what I could tell, they've been basically been encouraged to leave. With a weak uh, Yemeni government uh, and the uh, distance from the mainland, uh, there really isn't anything that the mainland does for Socotra. So it's probably to the advantage of the people living there that others have stepped in. That's just my opinion. Again, more military uh, in, uh, encounters here from U UAE. And of course, the people don't have much say in it. They live in an isolated environment. And uh, it's tough to get off the island. 
In fact, um, when I was on, um, on Socotra, in fact, that first morning there, we had to detour around a large group of protesters in the capital city. So what are the goals? It's clear that Emirates has a long-term serious interest in Socotra. with regional uh, implications. It isn't just Socotra, Socotra is a launching pad. So Socotra is an archipelago consisting of the main island, three smaller islands, and a small rock outcrops important for seabirds. In landmass, the main island is five times bigger than Bahrain, and for those of you familiar with Bahrain, that's a speck in the uh, uh, above Saudi Arabia. But uh, comparatively here locally, it's a little over half as large as Whatcom County. It's a mountainous island with many small settlements, most of them along the coast. The road system is primitive and shows up in red on this map. Approximately 50,000 people live on Socotra, with Haidibo being the largest city of around 8,500 and having the only airport nearby. The island even has its own license plate with the iconic dragon blood tree. Native residents sp seek the Socotri language, and it wasn't until 2014 that a writing system for the language was developed by a Russian team following five years of work. Socotra International Airport was built by the Emirates and opened in 1999. Flights were suspended in March 2015 due to the Saudi Arabian-led intervention in Yemen and resumed in late 2018. So it was about a year after when I was here that the airport had been reopened. When I visited, Yemen Airways was the only commercial carrier serving Yemen. There was only one flight a week to Socotra, connecting to Sayoun on the mainland and onward to Cairo, Egypt. Best information I have now is that once you book a tour on Socotra, the agent will take care of a visa to the island. Once a week, flights are from Abu Dhabi in United Arab Emirates, not Yemen. When you commit to coming here, you become a prisoner for seven days. It's about a 15 minute drive to town and the cloud formations were stunning. The same goes for the mountain on the other side of Hadibo. At first glance, the white could be taken for snow except that we're at 12 degrees latitude. It's white sand that gets blown from the beach, clear to the top. The first afternoon, we parked at a beach east of Haidibo, where I wandered by myself. The sand dune climbed part of the mountain, driven by the strong seasonal winds off the Arabian Sea. It would be quite climbable, but I wasn't motivated. It's common for the beach to change from sand to sharp rocks, given the variable coastline. A couple of locals were out collecting shells. In the left background is a freighter that was disabled by a cyclone, now moored offshore. As for shells and rocks, this is a small sampling of what I found. There was even a small lizard scooting around. For visual impact, the storm clouds rolled in later. Back in town, this was the best hotel, although there are supposedly three others. Since the bulk of my trip was camping, I only stayed here the first and last nights. 
Hadiba was anything but attractive. Fortunately, I didn't need to spend much time there. Dust, dirt, and rubbish were the norms. The agent on the mainland sent along a box of vegetables and fruit for me, knowing that perishables would be tough to find on the island. But fresh bread was available in the shops. Goats had run of the town. If you're not paying attention, they will steal food from outdoor restaurant tables and even jump onto the tables. Uh, during the intermission, a lady back there asked what the food was like on the mainland. Well, I responded that they eat a lot of rice. You come to Socotra, you eat a lot of rice. I considered the dumpster a joke. Since it's actually used, there seemed to be no landfill on the island. Most of this rubbish will blow or get washed to the sea. This shop made custom doors and was one of the visual bright spots on the town. The setting sun on the eastern clouds, taken from the hotel balcony, provided a fiery reflection. It wasn't until 2006 that the first sealed road appeared on the island. We were driving east out of Haidebo. Emirates wants control over the port of Socotra to boost its regional maritime trade. One of the regular vessels docking is a cement boat from Oman that makes scheduled trips. Some of the beaches had camp shelters for tourists, but they were in poor shape. None had waterproof roofs, so they were worthless when it rained. The birds, perch, birds perched on top are Egyptian vultures. While their population is declining worldwide, there are about 800 pairs on Socotra doing quite well. The locals provide lots of fish scraps and rubbish for the birds to feed on. This beach was very rocky with a lot of broken coral. It attracted some Arab scuba divers. Aside from some derelict equipment, it was wide open. From this angle, the rocks showed bright color. The sand dunes in back is where I'd spend the afternoon before. With the civil war in Yemen scaring off tourists and the difficulty in getting to Socotra, it's a good place to visit if you want solitude. This old wooden boat was one of the relics I found on the beach. A more modern piece was an electrical generator atop rusting oil drums. It was built in India by a branch of the second largest commercial vehicle manufacturer in that country. There was no indication how old it was. And my question is, how did it get there? On our way out, we stopped at this Muslim cemetery that's no longer used since it's full. The guide estimated it to be 200 years old. Two stones indicate that it's a grave of a male, and three, a female. Going further east, we made our way to Dihamri area with fishing settlements right above the water, the high water mark. The guide lived in one of the villages, and he invited me to his house, which he shared with an extended family. Tea was prepared by invisible women and served by men. Being Muslim, the women weren't permitted to interact with infidels. The cyclones repeatedly demolish these vulnerable houses. We stayed the night at this camp spot that was fenced to keep out the goats. The former cooking facility was locked and unused. Villagers had also built a separate structure with several squat toilets, but it was also locked since running water was no longer available. 
none of my campsites had usable toilet facilities. The sleeping area was clean since the goats were kept out, but the roof was only good for sun protection. A more rustic camp spot was close to the beach, damaged by the cyclones. The only occupants were goats seeking shade. The guide asked me which spot I wanted, and I opted for the stone structure away from the beach. Pretty much a no-brainer. The island's endemic bottle trees can survive on bare rock with little moisture. Molecular analysis has shown that the lineage is about twice as old as the island, which make them a relic of th that became extinct on the mainland. And everywhere were goats that do extensive damage to the unique flora of the island. In late afternoon sun, the beach provided some interesting walking. It was also a coral graveyard. There are 250 species of reef building corals on Socotra and the cyclones take their toll. And here are some images from the beach. There were no other campers, and we stayed dry that night. The sun dropped behind impressive clouds to the west, and it was dark by 6 p.m., being so close to the equator. I had, <clears throat> I had to get up at 5 a.m. the next morning so we could drive to Tierbach Village and pick up a local guide for a hike to Hook Cave. The white on the rocks showed up in many spots on the island in this part of the geology. We were on the trail by 6.15 to escape the broiling sun. By we, I mean myself and a fellow from the village. My regular guys wanted nothing to do with the outing. The route started out gentle, but that didn't last long, as it literally turned into a goat track. There are traces of it at the right, with the Arabian Sea in the background. The local guide I had knew two words of English, stop and smoke. And again, an earlier question at intermission, what languages are spoken on in Yemen? Well, not much English, and even less on Socotra. We were getting closer, but I still wasn't sure of the cave's entrance, and the guide couldn't tell me. To give some scale, keep an eye on his red shirt and the white miwas, the skirt. Finally, the entrance was more obvious up ahead. Thanks to the guide's sharp eye, he pointed out this snake on the trail. It was an endemic Socotran racer and non-venomous. The white on the rocks seemed to be fungi. This was the last view of the Arabian Sea before entering the cave. It was a huge opening preceded by bottle trees and other vegetation. The vital parts of the information sign revert to Arabic. Hook is the largest cave on the island, being over three kilometers, 1.8 miles deep. It holds a wealth of Socotri history and is full of archeological findings, such as paintings, pieces of pottery, and wooden tables with inscriptions in the Aramaic language dating back to 258 AD. 
This was at the entrance portal where it's difficult to judge scale without a human, which this picture has. Stalactites and stalagmites were here like in other caves. The main difference is that this cave is very primitive and gets few visitors. Once away from the entrance, it got completely black and a head torch was essential. The remainder of these pictures were taken with flash and don't do justice to the cavern. The grade went downhill on slippery clay with water dripping from overhead. The tiny droplets were captured in the shot. The only safety provisions were two random tapes with intermittent reflectors to keep one from wandering into an abyss. It's a shame these images don't do justice to what I saw and experienced. At the end was a pool with fresh water that the guide drank from since his water bottle was empty. I took a sip and it tasted strongly of minerals. Apparently this cave does go back in further, but even to this point it was getting dicey as for safety and without proper gear, I sure as heck wouldn't want it to take one step further. In fact, I was very glad to see daylight again to confirm that we had made it back safely. Once back down on flat ground, just across the road from the village, I watched locals launching their fishing boats. There were plenty of Egyptian vultures around everywhere on Socotra. One of the endemic birds is a Socotra starling. This one with a gray cape was a female, and both can swallow whole date pits. Not just one, but a lot of them. Because as I was waiting there at the village, uh, some of the locals gave me dates. And as I was spitting out the pits, the, the, the starling would keep picking them up. And it wasn't, I mean, I thought they would burst, but. There seemed to be no end to the room. So again, good cleanup on their part. The so-called road ends at Ras Moni Momi, which is the easternmost point of Socotra. The Arabian Sea on the north meets the Indian Ocean to the south. The guide said there was a difference in color, but I couldn't see any. Backtracking from there, we stopped at another fishing village where the catch was laid out on the sand. The truck and back had ice, but the fish had to be manhandled to it. They all seemed to be sharks, and dragging them was the easiest form of transport. Getting them into the truck required more muscle power. The big sharks were more valuable than tuna, fetching about $160 each for the fishermen. They made their way to the mainland for export. The kids made off with chunks of ice, and we bought some small tuna for dinner. That was a benefit of camping out in that fresh fish were always available. But I confess I got tired of it, though, eating it twice a day, and sometimes even three times. My guide called this stretch of beach Crab City. When ghost crabs excavate their burrows, sand gets piled into small pyramids. Since they're nocturnal, it would be hard to see any. Our campsite for the night was at this white sand dune near Archer Beach. It was the only place in five nights out that I encountered other people. The appeal for climbing the dune and sliding down intrigued some locals from the area. 
And when I said that I encountered other people, they were not Westerners. Sunrise the next morning gave it a different appearance. A freshwater stream coming out of the mountain provided water, and the night before I washed my clothes in a bucket and also took a shower of sorts. Wet laundry got hung in the bushes, but high enough so the goats wouldn't get to it. Dishes were washed in the stream by the truck, and we were ready to move on. One of the routes leading south leads to the Mome Plateau and the Home Hill protected area. The monsoon season had ended in September and October was warm and windless. Away from the coast, these trees were brown and looked dead, but they were just waiting for the right conditions to leaf out. A tiny settlement on an estuary had pens to contain goats and sheep. Looking inland, there was a grove of date palms. Other than rudimentary subsistence farming, the locals aren't much into agriculture. Continuing to the plateau, there was more brown than green. Our road was carved into the hillsides and so steep in places that four-wheel drive was essential. Which brought us to the protected area. Protected against what wasn't really clear since there was a village on top along with grazing animals. It offered a range of flora diversity, including one of the three varieties of frankincense trees on the island. Socotra was at one time a big producer of the resin, but no more. Then there's a cucumber tree, also known as a bottle tree, an endemic species that does well in dry areas. The plateau was intermixed with them that store moisture in their thick trunks. Since this area is heavily grazed, young plants struggle to get established. And that's true for all of the island. The real purpose in coming here was a short hike to a pool. The opposite hillside was covered with dragon blood trees. This is another of Socotra's endemic species, and many had been damaged by recent cyclones. They are also called umbrella trees because of the shade they provide, not just for humans, but animals as well. The name comes from the red sap that oozes from under the bark which has medicinal properties as well as being used as a dye. The bottle trees were the most amazing to me for their ability to grow in the harshest conditions. Seeds dropped into pockets of rock germinate and take root. The flowers are known as desert rose. This confused tree had one bloom, even though it wasn't the season. And there was this solo blooming specimen, also on hard rock. Fresh water comes from a spring and provides sustenance to animals and people living here. Topsoil seemed to be a scarce commodity. The turquoise colored pool draws swimmers, but I was satisfied just to appreciate the scenery and surroundings. Down below was a beach and vast expanse of the Arabian Sea. And the guide told me that during the last cyclone, 
fishing boats from the beach had come all the way up here. That's how intense the wind was. Our route out was the same we came in on. Much of the road maintenance was done by hand by the locals. Moving to a different part of the interior, a gravel road provided access. Settlements were scattered at the base of the Hajir Mountains. If the villages had electricity at all, it would be from local generators or solar panels. Wadi Dirhur Canyon and the south coast was our destination. In some places, the wadi was the road. This is the only place on Socotra where I saw camels. They are still used by trekking outfitters traversing the backcountry. There were many date palms and shady places along the water to camp and relax. We had lunch in this area and immediately attracted pesky goats. Once out of the canyon, the terrain changed. Trees in the north were mostly brown, but here they were green. New two-story center block houses were being built by United Arab Emirates to relocate Emir residents away from the coast where the cyclones destroy the homes. UAE has done an end run around Saudi Arabia for control of the island. They've been aggressive in building housing for the residents in an effort to curry fervor, favor with the locals. The trade-off is that Emirates wants to build a military base in this area, which, for, which will forever change the complexion of southern Socotra Island. When I was here, the Yemenese flag was still intact, painted on the mountain. Fishing was the main activity in this coastal village. Most of these houses were abandoned due to being badly damaged by storms. Building materials consisted of what was collected from the beach. The Indian Ocean on the south is more active than the Arabian Sea on the north. The cyclones typically originate in the Indian Ocean. Like elsewhere, the Egyptian vulture was here too. It's doubtful these guys went to school. Instead, they spent their time playing in the water. It's only boys who go to the beach. Muslim girls don't seem to have the privilege. It was another beautiful part of the island, but there was no sandy beach. The breakers provided an opportunity for surfing, which on Socotra meant using a piece of scrap wood. Moving away from the beach took us to the Zehek sand dunes with the Indian Ocean in the background. This expanse of sand is constantly shifting with the wind. Our campsite for the night was at the base of the dunes. The guide miscalculated the weather and we got caught in a rainstorm that started around 20 hundred hours or 8 p.m. We had to throw our gear into the 4x4 and the driver struggled to find his way out before the greasy soil trapped us. We made it to a different beach area where we set up the tents again in the dark and this is what greeted me in the morning. It was another new settlement of white painted concrete built by Emirates. The town had its own electrical generator and this gaggle of poly piping atop the ground is how fresh water is delivered to much of Socotra. It's drawn from hillside springs, but the ground is too rocky to bury the pipes. 
This playground and mosque were the community's public amenities. Once we left there, we passed other houses on the plain. Dig Up Cave in the hillside was our destination. A very rough track leads to the cave, which some operators still drive, but we walked the short distance. The cave only goes a short way into the mountain with no tunnels. The entrance was the most impressive, most impressive feature. Because of the moisture, it attracts bats and swifts who have built hundreds of nests on the ceiling. It had its own special qualities, but very different from Hook Cave on the north. Since this one is so much more easily accessed, it also gets most of the visitors. Goats also hung out here since it provided shade. The view from the entrance looks out over the plains to the Indian Ocean. It was another example of how changeable the landscape is on the island. Heading back north, Dixon Plateau was the last opportunity to see bottle trees. It also had one of the largest forests of dragon blood trees. If the rocks could talk, there would be an interesting story of how this water-filled cleft had been created. The canyon below had a stream and there was plenty of green browse on top for the goats. In fact, it had just rained, so uh, the farmers that we talked to were very happy for the moisture. Cyclones from 2018 left little of Socotra untouched and the dragon blood trees, being the tallest, were hit the hardest. From a visual standpoint, this was a most unique part of the island. I had a hard time leaving this area. Hidden close to the ground were flowers, most of which will remain a mystery to me. And for you avid botanists, you might pick up some names here. Over 835 vascular plants have been recorded on Socotra. 318 are found nowhere else in the world. Making 37% of the island's plants endemic. Only Galapagos, New Caledonia, and Hawaii have higher numbers. I was able to identify the spiny Mexican poppy bloom. Leaving the central part of the island, we went north and west for two more nights of beach camping. Coming off the Dixon Plateau, the coastline and Arabian Sea unfolded below. Due to no guardrails and few warning signs, it wasn't unusual to see wrecked vehicles like the one below. The good news is, is, is that the island has few vehicles. And speaking of vehicles, I had two and they broke both both broke down, which is why we had to move to the second one, which also broke down. We camped here at this abandoned, elaborate beachfront house. The crew had to bum potable water in jerry cans from a house up the road. At 3 a.m., rain hit us again, but at least we had a short move into the house, which had a solid roof. The full moon that night over the Arabian Sea was a treat, and so was the sunrise the following morning. Traveling west provided a different kind of forest, 
Locals scour the land for dead trees used for firewood. I don't know what this tree was, so let's say it's just another alien plant of Socotra. This was identifiable as a type of frankincense tree. Our driver was beside me. Uh, incidentally, I didn't wear my um, native garb on Socotra. There was no need for it, um, other than, uh, and I, um, well, there just wasn't a terrorist threat, and, uh, and I was happy not to uh, have to deal with the, uh, head, uh, the turban. Eventually, we came to the Ditwa protected area opposite the lagoon of the same name. Protected doesn't mean the lo locals don't leave rubbish. This Egypt Egyptian vulture was looking for scraps on the ground. The campsite was owned by a Muslim woman who lived in the stone house above. She rented out the tent to tourists, but there was no toilet or running water. It would have kept us dry had it rained again. Even with some of the flaps open, it was uncomfortably hot. The woman spoke at length to the guide and driver, and they communicated in Socotri. I dubbed her the Queen of Ditwa, which she gracefully accepted. She allowed me to take pictures of her, but not me with her. The most remarkable thing about her was that near sunset, she and a small boy took off for the mountain to the rear. They were both barefoot, and she carried a stick to round up the goats. It was about a half mile to the base, and then they climbed straight up the slope and across to fetch the animals. She came back with a metal bucket she had found, along with a dead tree over her shoulder. Let me go back here. That wasn't supposed to happen. Um, yeah, the dead tree over her shoulder for firewood. It was all in a day's work for a Muslim woman on Socotra. Aside from the rubbish, the lagoon was beautiful, hemmed in by a white sand barrier. The only water egress was an opening to the right. The town of Kualansia is the closest to Ditwa Lagoon, and these schoolboys provided an enthusiastic photo op. Rather than go on a fishing boat ride, I asked to be taken into one of the schools. The town had a population of about 4,000, so the school was quite large, with 1,500 students in several old buildings. This was a headmaster with a board explaining the English alphabet with Arabic translation. All the cross classrooms I visited had progressive grades of Muslim girls 12 plus years old. They didn't allow me to be photographed, but did ask me questions in halting English. Students sat three or four abreast on the hard seats and shouted out answers in unison. The peeling paint is obvious, but if you look closely, you'll see no lights or electrical outlets. This is strictly a daytime operation. Outside the town and along other parts of the coastline, I'd seen Soviet tanks pointing to the sea. They don't work anymore and were installed between 1971 and 1985. Just over the rise from that tank was a view of one of the prettiest beaches anywhere. For beachgoers, this would be an idyllic destination, except for no shade. United Arab Emirates wants to build a new port near here on the northwest part of the island. Additionally, Emirates and Israel are working silently to establish spy bases on the island. Looking 180 degrees south shows the town harbor. Fishing is a main economic activity. With Telephoto, another village showed up. 
it was an anomaly on Socotra in, the, in that it was clean and they burned their rubbish. They used to be wired to the generator in Qualencia, but storms tore down the power lines, so now they have electricity a few hours a day from their own diesel power plant. The boats had just come in and haggling over fish was in full swing. Unlike the group of boys some pictures back in white school shirts, these kids didn't seem to go to school. Buying and selling took place right on the garbage-covered beach. My guide bought some fish that were taken to his nearby aunt's house and prepared for lunch. The two boys in the water were pulling homemade boats made from tin cans, as he's showing here. It used to be a container of instant mango-flavored drink powder from the Emirates. Once the fish were sold, the beach went mostly quiet. My last night in Haidibo, I heard from another traveler that their boat ride here resulted in a dead engine on the water and being rescued by a different boat. In order to get to the other village, we had to drive through the water. Animal herding was done by women and children. Once we got to the other side, it became a different part of Socotra and also Yemen. Due to abundant water from the mountains, everything was green and the villagers kept the area clean. Date palms were the big commercial crop and they were well cared for. Channels directed water because dates are fussy about moisture requirements. The new trees were wrapped to protect them from the goats. Once they got big enough, more durable material was placed around them. This man was working on chain link fencing, and I asked how old the trees were. He said the oldest were there since, ever since he could remember, and he was 50 years old. To supply the town's water needs, water flows from the mountain through the two big poly pipes on the right into two reservoirs. By our standards, it's a cobbled together mess, but on Socotra, it's high tech. Every connection leaked, and they've used the equivalent of duct tape to hold things together. Since there's no danger of freezing, all the connections are above ground. The puddles provide drinking water for the goats. We stopped at the primary school with two main buildings. The gray building on the left is the older one with a toilet in the center. The new structure on the right was built by United Arab Emirates. About 60 students attend here. This was a headmaster's eight-year-old daughter who wasn't actually a student since she's not dressed properly. Starting with the youngest class in this wing, the genders would normally be segregated. Since the school is so small, girls were grouped by themselves and always in the back. My guide took a seat in the rear. Unlike the hard group benches in the other school, these students had individual desks. They were all very curious about me and gave me an enthusiastic welcome since I was the first American to visit a classroom here. This was a different classroom with older students. Here all the girls had their heads covered and still sat in the back. This was the third and last classroom, overwhelming girls, but still relegated to the rear. Maybe you've noticed it, but, but like the other school, there was no electricity. The open shutters provided light and ventilation. 
With all the difficulties of traveling in Yemen, visiting the two schools left me with fond memories of the country, and especially Socotra. Hopefully, the students will take the curled poster in the classroom to heart. And with that, we'll say goodbye to Socotra and Yemen.